Today we're doing our final installment of the Seal of the Prophets. The objection from the Islamic community to the Baha'i community that the Quran states that the Prophet Muhammad is the Seal of the Prophets and therefore there can be no revelation after the Prophet Muhammad and therefore Baha'u'llah cannot be a messenger of God. When we first looked at this, we looked at the concept of seal in the Quran from its Arabic root and saw that seals can in fact actually be removed by God and in some cases by the righteous in the day of God. We also looked at the drumbeat of the Quran, how the Quran consistently tells stories of how prophets are sent to humankind and then they are rejected by the communities unto which they are sent. This is important, as I pointed out, because all of these stories within the Qur'an end up being irrelevant lessons. If we take them to be simply stories about past people and their errors, then they are not instructive to the Islamic community of this day. And I propose that this would make massive sections of the Qur'an completely irrelevant to the individual who's reading it. Whereas if we see these stories as warnings to the Islamic community that they too might follow the path of previous communities, suddenly these sections of the Qur'an become fully relevant. It's important to note how this has been commonly interpreted, and by this I mean the concept of news or tidings, within chapter 49, verse 6. If a wicked man comes to you with news, look into it carefully, lest you harm a people in ignorance and later repent. This concept is currently interpreted as simply information or news, which could be information or news about anything. Another concept I want to put forward, which I have touched on briefly before, is the problem of scales. Today we're going to be looking at a couple instances of the term Naba, or tidings, within the Qur'an. There are two of them in particular, and I put these aside because they seem at first glance to not be about prophetic claimants. What I want to bring forward as the problem of scales is that imagine you are reading as a Muslim this quote from the Qur'an about a wicked man and his tidings. And it is saying that you should examine carefully, and lest you harm a people in ignorance and later have to repent. Now, you will think to yourself, well, what does this mean, this tidings? And you think, well, actually, it simply means news. It's not about prophetic claimants. I don't have to investigate individuals who claim to be bringing a message of God. Which means you're interpreting these concepts of all these stories, including the oceans of ink and pens and the words of God, as being irrelevant data to you particularly. In order to do this, you yourself engage in a study of this term, Naba. You've done exactly what we have done here. And you find, throughout your investigation, two instances. Two instances, say, out of 27, which seem to not fully follow the concept that news in the context of the Qur'an relates to prophetic claimants. But on the other hand, on your scale, you actually have 25 instances that are telling you that this word is directly related to and about messages from God, messages from the unseen from God, stories of prophets, the Qur'an itself, which is a Nabah, and the day of God itself, which is a Nabah, a great tidings. So you have 25 instances on one side that are telling you, well, this term, when God uses it, as opposed to some individual in your community, when God uses this term, he uses it to talk about messages from himself to his people. And then you take this and you say, well, I'm going to interpret this warning that I might harm a people and later have to repent with these two instances. This would be, I think, unjust. Even if these two instances, which we're going to look about at today, had nothing to do with prophetic claimants, you would still be sitting in front of a data set of, say, 27 instances, and 25 of them tell you that you should take this very seriously, in a very heavy way, pun intended. But you choose to use the two, which are, if you will, exceptions or outliers, to interpret this one instance. This would be unjust, yet it would be keeping, in some sense, with the way God communicates to humankind. He always gives us a note. You don't have to interpret it this way, but if you're being just when you have 25 instances, 
and you might, by taking it with the two exceptions, harm a people in ignorance by not investigating and later have to repent, I would suggest this would be a very, very bad idea. One of the things I want to also touch on is the intensity of my emotional content in some of these presentations so far. The reason why is I don't believe this is some academic study into certain terms within the Quran related to religion in general. In the very text itself, it says that you should investigate carefully, lest you harm a people in ignorance. And the reason why I might get emotional surrounding this topic is because people have been harmed. The Babi and Baha'i community throughout history has been persecuted. Individuals tortured, imprisoned, and killed. And some of these people are my friends. This idea that one does not need to investigate when someone comes forward with a claim has actually caused great suffering to communities and to people that I know personally. It's also important to notice that this concept that no messenger is going to come after your chosen messenger is not exclusive to Islam. Christians themselves very often refuse to investigate Islam because they believe that after Jesus Christ came, there would be no messenger from God to humankind until the great day of God, which would be self-evident and everyone could see what was happening, so they have no duty to investigate. The Jewish community themselves believe, for the most part, that they do not need to investigate the claims of either Jesus Christ or the Prophet Muhammad because divine revelation ceased, which is criticized in the Quran as we saw in the seal video. And this is highlighted by Baha'u'llah in the Book of Certitude. We're going to begin looking now at these two instances. These two, if you will, outliers that on the surface seem at first not to relate to divine revelation. So in this first verse where it says that the hoopoe, a bird, has come from Sheba with tidings true, that tidings true is Naba Yaqeen, very certain tidings. So the hoopoe bird is in Sheba and states that these individuals are worshipping the sun besides God. And that Satan has made their deeds seem pleasing in their eyes. So they think they are doing what is right. They think they are worshipping properly. So what does Solomon do in this case? He hears from his messenger, obviously in this story a miraculous messenger, that the Queen of Sheba is worshipping the sun instead of God. He gets this report, this tidings true, stated from the hoopo. And does he take it immediately as true? No, he does not. Soon we shall see whether thou hast told the truth or lied. He is investigating. Nubal goes to Sheba, comes back and states that these people are idolaters. Solomon himself states that he's not going to take this as, if you will, sorry, gospel, but is going to look into it. And he sends her a letter. And it's interesting here, in verse 29, when it says, The Queen says, Ye chiefs, here is delivered to me a letter worthy of respect. It says, Kitab Karim, the most noble book, a noble book. And I think it's interesting here because this term is used for the Quran itself. And I'm going to propose something that what's happening here is the letter being sent from Solomon, who is one of the purported authors of the Old Testament, is sending a letter of his to the Queen of Sheba, a Kitab Karim. And I will propose that outside of some other evidence, this is actually revelation from Solomon. It is a letter, a Kitab Karim, a noble book being given from Solomon to Sheba. Pausing once again, I think it's very important because it says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. This is the opening of the surahs of the Quran. So this letter being sent to the Queen of Sheba is a noble book, a Kitab Karim, a title used for the Quran itself. And the letter sent to Sheba begins with, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, in the name of God, 
the most gracious, the most merciful, as the sources of the Quran begin. This can, should not be lost on someone. So when it states this, it says, and come to me Muslimina, as a Muslim. So the ambassadors come, Solomon is tested with wealth, he rejects it because what he has is better. He then asks for her throne, the throne upon which she sits, to be brought to him. And it is brought to him. And then it's interesting. Solomon states, transform her throne out of all recognition by her. So take the throne and make it so that she cannot recognize it. Change its form and see whether she is guided to the truth or if she is incapable of receiving it. So it's very interesting. She comes and there's a test placed in front of her. It is the original throne. The original throne she sat on. Her sovereignty, the sign of her sovereignty. But it's actually changed to look completely differently. But it is in fact her throne still. She recognizes it and claims she has been guided to see this. Solomon then diverts her from the worship of false gods. He turns her to the faith of God so that she becomes a Muslim. Solomon in the Quran is given the capacity to speak to the birds. A miraculous ability. He sends the hupo, who comes back from Sheba, claiming that there is a person there. He's claiming with sure tidings that there is a person there, the Queen of Sheba, who worships the sun, does not worship the one true God. He decides to look into this carefully, lest he harm a people. How do we know that? Well, he states he's going to see whether or not the hupo has lied or speaks the truth. And it's important that right after, the Queen of Sheba speaks of how kings will come in and lay waste to countries, causing harm to people. If Solomon had done this initially, he would have done it out of ignorance. But instead, Solomon first looks into the matter himself. And he then presents to her a Kitab Karim, a noble book, which, as I noted, begins with the Bismillah. He then asks for her throne to be brought to him, and then it is disguised as if to see if she can find her true sovereignty even when it looks differently. So she herself has a test that she has to investigate and see what is her own even though it looks differently. So I will state that this story, almost on every point, fully accords with the concept of the wicked man as represented in Surah 49, verse 6. There is an individual report, a tiding. Related to what? Related to whether one is accepting the true message of God. There is a claim or a possibility that this is false. Solomon chooses to investigate and look carefully into it so he does not harm a people. When it comes to the throne, I think it's fascinating because this, in a sense, is what one, the Islamic community, asks of the Christian and Jewish community, and the Zoroastrian community, I would add. And it is exactly what the Baha'is ask of the Islamic community. How is this so? It's interesting here, and this is a concept that we find over and over within the Quran, that individuals who were not Islamic in the sense of the revelation of the Prophet Muhammad are deemed to be Muslims, those who submit to God. The Queen of Sheba here becomes a Muslim. And she has asked to become a Muslim. What is this? It's that there is the faith of God, eternal in the past and eternal in the future. The faith of God, where out of faith and belief in the divine reality and its communication with humankind, we submit to that. Yet, from a Jewish perspective, when they were looking, at, say, for example, looking at Christianity, they would see the throne of their faith. And it's important to note here. If we look back, it says it kept them from the path of God that they should not worship God, who brings to light what is hidden in the heavens and the earth and knows what ye hide and what ye reveal. God, there is no God but He, Lord of the throne supreme. So it's interesting that this concept of the throne comes up in the case of 
the throne the Queen of Sheba is sitting on, and then it stated that the throne of God is actually supreme, and then Solomon has the throne brought from the Queen of Sheba, which she has to see if her true throne can be discerned even though it is altered in appearance. I propose that this is actually what the Jewish people had to do in the case of Christianity. Christianity, although others might see not see this, looks very, very strange to the Jewish eyes. It does not appear to them to be, on the surface, the faith that they originally had. Yet the claim of the Christian community is that it is the very essence of the original faith. The Islamic community, when it actually approaches the Christian community, is saying, well, in the end, Jesus Christ himself was a Muslim. He was a submitter under God. So was Moses. So was Abraham. But it is undeniable that those faiths appear on the surface differently. The throne has been altered in its external appearance, yet it is still that throne. And that is the actual test that any member, say, from an Islamic perspective, that a Christian or Jew, or Zoroastrian, would actually have to overcome. They would have to be able to see that this, this is their throne. And in fact, it is a symbol of the throne supreme, the throne of God. This is what the Baha'i community is asking of the Islamic community. And in particular, in this series of videos, that this throne might seem different to you on the surface. But you are to be like the Queen of Sheba, who thinks what they're doing is right, right? Their deeds are pleasing to them, but they are to investigate and see if they can see beyond the surface representation to see the throne supreme. So at this point, I think it's undeniable that this is about faith and acceptance of the message of God, of a Kitab Karim. It is, as I said, opening with the Bismillah. It is a story about individuals coming to investigate the possibility of a true revelation from God, from the stance of Sheba, and it's also an investigation from the sacred community of Solomon to ensure they do not harm a people in error for not looking into report and examining. So this next potential exception is just the news of you. Here in chapter 33, the context is actually the besieging of the Islamic community by the Quraysh, the Meccan tribes that are attempting to exterminate the Islamic community. The Confederates are groups that have allied with the Quraysh themselves. And it's stating that if the Confederates, those who allied with the Quraysh, come again, they, these insincere ones, who claim to have faith and claim to be on the side of the Islamic community, but are actually not, will wish they were in the desert with the Bedouins asking about your news. And grammar-wise, this can also mean your news, or news of you. What is the news here? Because obviously that is the context we're looking at. We're trying to understand how is the Qur'an using this term, and can it be seen in the context of all the other quotes that we have looked at? And I think it fully can. They're asking about his news, your news, the news of the Prophet Muhammad. And it speaks about the Prophet Muhammad himself being a noble pattern. A beautiful pattern that can be followed by the Islamic community. And it says in verse 22, This is what God and his apostle has promised us, and he told us what was true. So the believers are saying, well, what we are seeing here is actually what has been told to us by the Prophet Muhammad, and it is true. We're seeing that it's coming true. The context is the revelation of God to the apostle. The unbelievers did not believe what God and his apostle told them. The believers did. These are the surahs of the Quran, the revelations about what is to come, the victim of sorry, the victory of the Muslim community in the face of much adversity. They are wishing they'd be out there listening for the news. And what is this news? And it's interesting here in this context, the it's not naba singular, it's anba which is a plural. Why do we have the plural term anba? If you look at the Arabic, it doesn't say naba single. Tiding. It is tidings. Well, what is going on? It's saying that they are out, they will wish they were in the desert asking for your news, your tidings. It's important to notice that at this point in history, 
the Quran is not fully revealed. A surah would be revealed, time would pass. A surah would be revealed, and time would pass. They're told here in the, in the actual context that they're asking about these anba, these tidings, these news, right, that belong to the Prophet Muhammad. And it is what God and his Apostle has told them. The believers are saying this is what God and the Apostle have told us, right? And they're saying, well, they're, they're going to wish they're outside listening to what that is, which are the revelations of the Quran themselves, the surahs themselves. Because the Quran is not yet a full book. The Anba are, they wish they were outside, if you will, getting a pulse on what the, the Prophet Muhammad is saying and what the Islamic community is doing. And I, I believe it's very clear, if we look into the history of Islam and the Quraysh and the Confederates, and even those within the Islamic community who might have been vacillating, this is what they were trying to see. They would be looking and listening to a recently revealed surah to see what it was telling them to do and what they would need to carry out and what the future held. Because those who were not firm in their faith, who would not fulfill their vows, were gauging their, if you will, support and adherence to the Islamic community based on what was being said. So can we see this? Instead of having these two possible exceptions, and all these other terms being about stories about prophets, revelations from the unseen, communications from God, the Quran being a Daba, right? And the Day of God being a Daba, can we see the Queen of Sheba being in that context? Yes, we fully can. We then have only one instance, which would be this one, but again, when we look at it, I think it's very clear that we can see that they're asking about his revelations. They're asking what the Prophet Muhammad has said, God and his Apostle, right, in this context, has actually proclaimed, which the believers take as revelation, and those who are out with the Bedouins are seeking as information that they can use. So once again, what is it? It's the Quran. It falls fully into the categories that we have previously examined. So I would state, we don't have a single exception in the entire set that cannot be easily seen as part of a set defining Naba or tidings or news as revelations from the unseen, as communication from God and even scripture itself. In chapter 49 verse 6 it states, if a wicked man comes to you with tidings, and I'm going to go right for it here and say, if a wicked man comes to you with stories of the prophets, a pro proposed book of God, a claim about the day of God, or claiming to bring tidings from the unseen court of God himself, because that's how the term is defined, <laughs> then you must look into it carefully. And remember, we looked at Tabayana to investigate, and each of those instances actually related to investigating prophetic claims. So the tidings, if a wicked man comes to you with tidings, and that all had to do, all now can be seen as to doing with revelation and communications from God, look into it carefully, which all those contexts actually relate to investigation into prophetic claims, lest you harm a people in ignorance and later have to repent. What about this wicked man? Naturally, if you are supposed to look into such claims from someone you see as wicked, obviously how much more if that individual is deeply pious, has an intense and glorious prayer life, is willing to sacrifice himself, all of his comforts and joys, for the purpose of raising up this claim that God has communicated to mankind. Because this is the prophetic pedigree. So even if it was a wicked man. But there's something else here. We've seen in many of these instances that these people saw the prophets themselves as wicked men. Fomenters of discord. Those who spread corruption in the land. 
And remember, when we look through the drumbeat of the Quran, the ways that these individuals would begin to justify their persecution and maltreatment of these individuals is they would say things like, well, he's just a man like myself. He's only human. Well, we've known him since he was young. He's one of our people, right? Oh, well, the people that actually follow him are kind of just lowly and they're, they're of no import. But each of these instances, these are claims made against the Baha'i community and against Baha'u'llah himself. And it's important, even if it doesn't mean that Baha'u'llah is a messenger from God, that it's important that the vast majority of rejections and objections posed to it fall into the category of those justifications of prior communities so they did not have to accept a prophetic claim. And here we have the Quran itself I'll put it very frankly, warning the Islamic community that a naba, a tiding is coming, and that when that tiding comes, if they don't look into it carefully, they're going to harm people, and they will later have to repent. But this then gets fed back into the concept of the seal of the prophets itself. You see, from the very beginning of this study, we saw that Baha'u'llah and the Bab never actually debate that the Prophet Muhammad is the seal of the Prophets. That prophecy would be sealed from the Prophet Muhammad's dispensation until the Day of God. But what is that Day of God called? It is called an the Tidings, the Great News. So if there is no naba, no tidings or news, from the Prophet Muhammad unto the Day of God, but at the exact same time, the Quran is stating that if someone comes to you claiming to have a naba, which means, in the context of the Quran, the Quran, revelation, a Day of God, look into it carefully, lest you harm a people in ignorance. What does that inherently tell us? It tells us that we can miss the Day of God. It tells us that we can have the Day of God come upon us, and we can actually reject it. And in our rejecting, see the righteous who have unsealed the choice wine as wicked in themselves and harm them. I think really it's important to look at this and to contemplate this. If he's the seal of the prophets, and the Naba is the day of God, and we have to investigate someone who claims to come with a Naba, revelation, it means we could miss it, because we could harm those people. So how in the end can we look at this concept of the seal of the prophets? I think really, just frankly put, the prophet Muhammad is the seal of the prophets, and today is the day of God. And while the Islamic community can see Baha'u'llah and the Bab as wicked men claiming to have tidings, they best not reject it outright, claiming they are just men. Why doesn't he send down an angel for us? Right? Isn't he just one of us, a man like me? No, they should examine it very carefully, because the day of God can be missed. Thank you.